I? On Instagram, I am not. Okay, I'm live and alive and alive. Last week, we had Jill Bolte Taylor on the gathering room, and she kept saying, everything boils down to, I'm alive, I'm alive. The joy of living is everything. So yeah, we're live on Instagram, on Facebook, and in our bodies. Oh, Although, yeah. what? On YouTube. on YouTube also. Although some of you may be ghosts. I don't know. I suspend disbelief. I totally. If you're a ghost, you have my respect. We're inclusive here of all ghosts. So hi, Alexa. Hi, I love you too. Tracy and I'm Karina. So good to see you. Like from Lily Hammer, she, she schleps in every single week for the gathering room and Wendy and Sarah and everybody. It's so amazing to see you, Lindsay and Melanie, Cheryl. I'm just waiting for, does it have a number on this? We, we're using a new software. Roy, does it have a, a number where it says how many peoples have come? Yeah, do you want me to let you know? Yeah, yeah I want to get to, uh, when we get to a hundred, I start everything. Okay, is it? Oh, not yet. Anyway, so it's just us. Quickly, before the others get here, what do we need to discuss? Ah, Kirsten and Gail and Kit and Christine and Lynette, we're all discussing something. We haven't decided what it is. Mm, but the other people, when they come, they will certainly be out of luck. Are they there? Close enough. Let's do it. Good afternoon, if you're in mm, America or North, or basically the Western Hemisphere. Good morning, good evening, and good day, if you're, and good night, if you're any place around the globe. I'm so happy you're here in the gathering room. It's the best place. And it's a little bittersweet for me this week because I have to take two weeks off. So I won't get to talk to you again until three weeks from today because I am going in to do a little fancy. They're going to do some fancy work on my feet. Fancy footwork, actually just one foot. So I've talked about this. I have alluded to this before that I have funky feet that need to be operated upon. And thank you all. You've sent suggestions and I have heard them and I am deeply grateful for them. But I'm pretty sure what I need to do now. So I'm going in and they're going to do things to my feet. And for two weeks after the surgery, which is Wednesday, I have to keep my foot above my heart. It's like hand over heart, only with your foot, which is more complicated. So I have been thinking about, okay, I'm teaching a course, I'm, I'm teaching coaches, I'm doing um, training vi videos or uh, training calls like this. I'm gonna be teaching practical wayfinding, the creativity mindset. Yay, if you've signed up. And even if you haven't, yay. So, but I'm going to be doing it with my foot above my heart. Like that. See how well my shoes and socks match? It's really, and there's paint on my pants. It's like, that's just the whole look of me. Um, it's, the, it's the COVID style. So uh, I've been thinking about, damn, how am I going to teach class to these wonderful people when I have to keep my foot above my heart? for like hours on end because I couldn't do what I just did for hours on end. And I've been doing a lot of reading and brain study and like reading everything I can about creativity and the creativity, um, different functions of creativity, different brain functions that lead to creativity, different life situations, life situations that lead to creativity. And what I've realized is that having to do something under constraints that make it seem difficult is actually the source of creative inspiration. And some people who have studied the subject just say that, so I have to credit them with it. But if you look at the way people have invented things, um, for example, Alexander Graham Bell had a relative who was going deaf and he tried and tried to create a hearing aid and he was working on his hearing aid and his his friend Watson was in the other room and he said into the hearing aid, Watson, come here. I want you, which these days would have been taken maybe differently, but he just said, <laughs> Watson, come here. I want you. And Watson was in a whole different room with another part of the hearing aid. And it turned out they'd made a telephone by accident. So like it was, if he hadn't been trying to make a hearing aid, he wouldn't have come up with the telephone. Yeah. So then I started to think about how, um, in my own life, 
every time I've met with constraints that seem difficult, I've had a creative leap. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about because all of us are facing problems and limitations in our lives and it's scary and it's frustrating and it can make us all feel very put upon. But in fact, the more problems we have, I remember a time when I was so messed up that I thought, okay, this has got to be an advantage in some way. And I think if I can figure my way out of this, I could actually, people could actually pay me to teach them how to deal with their problems because I have so many. So I was thinking about, for example, when I was, um, I grew up drawing, drawing, drawing. I drew all the time. And um, Jill Bolte Taylor and I had some, so much fun talking about how we flip on the right sides of our brains by drawing. And it was a lovely way for me to escape what was sometimes a very chaotic and, and distressing childhood. And then I got, I went to college and I met my favorite mentor, best professor at Harvard, if you want my say so, um, brilliant artist named Will Ryman, who taught uh, art classes. And so he taught an entry level drawing class and I went and signed up for it. It was the best thing I ever did. And I love to draw with pencils. I'd been drawing with pencils my whole childhood, my whole adolescence, and I'd really gotten pretty comfortable with pencil and charcoal, media that you can sort of, you can control line thickness, you can press hard with the pencil and make a dark line, you can lighten up and make the line go soft or disappear. You can create shading, like almost coloring with the pencil. You can do all these things with pencils. And we use pencils the first semester of that year and I was having a great time drawing away like crazy. Then one day, Will, Will Ryman, my professor, came up behind me or next to me while I was drawing and he, um, I had a pad of paper in front of me. I was drawing on it with a pencil and he dropped something onto the paper and it was a rapidograph pen. Rapidographs, if you haven't used them, are little pens that you fill up with India ink and then they make one that you buy a different pen for each thickness of line that you wanna make. And you make a black line of that exact thickness. That's all that will come out of that pen. And Will said, I want you to draw with that from now on. And I was like, um, okay. So I started trying to draw the way I was used to drawing with this pen that was just black lines. There was no way to shade, there was no way to blend, there was no way to suggest. I was losing my mind. And one day I was sitting in Chinese class and just to get away mentally from the Chinese class, <laughs> I was doodling away with my little rapidograph that Will gave me. And I started, I started making little circles and then I sort of bunched them up and then I started making little triangles and then I bunched them up and then I, and suddenly I realized the, that I was creating different textures by bunching up these lines. I mean, it's called cross hatching technically, but with a rapidograph, with pen and ink, which is how they used to in the old ye oldie days, um, they were drawing with like quills from geese. And you can only move the line in a certain direction with a, a pen like that, with a quill. Rapidographs, you could go all kinds of different directions. So what I did is I started making all these different textures with pen. I brought, <laughs> this fell off the wall today and I was reframing it. So I, I was undecided about showing you this. But this is a drawing that I did when I was living in Singapore. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. So many lights. Um, it's just a little boy. Sorry, the glass is hard to see through. It's a little boy standing at a, a store in Singapore, looking into one of these little um, roadside stands that they have all over Singapore. Um, and it was it's not usually a subject I would have drawn with pen and ink, but you can see kind of how I made a way to create images using that medium. And I did it because Will took away from me all my best tricks. So then I got used to the pen and ink and I was like quite chuffed with myself. And then one day he walked by and he dropped a watercolor brush onto the paper and said, that's all you can use. You could not be more different from pencil or pen. You put down a mark in watercolor and then you wait for like an hour to see what it's gonna do. There's like no control. It's, because I've heard it called the art of controlling accidents. Well, I had control with my pen. I had control with my pencil. Watercolor just does what it darn well pleases. And I fought and I wrestled. 
And I played with the watercolors. And after a while, I started to see the things that watercolors could do. So here is an example of something that I painted. Again, I was, I was in Florence and I looked out the window of my hotel room and I did a little cityscape of the Duomo. Um, and you can see that the paint kind of is going all kinds of different directions. Like I didn't paint that in, I just put like purple on the paper and then weighed it to see what it would do. And when it came to a standstill, <laughs> I would try to nudge the paint other ways. Anyway, so this is what I what kept happening to me with art. And I'm not an artist professionally, so I just decided I would always give myself an impossible challenge. And then it started happening in my life. So it was uh, in when I was in graduate school, as many of you know, that's when I started having, I got married, had my first child, big, big constraint to try to go to graduate school, work your way through graduate school and have a child. I thought, okay, this is a really massive constraint. What can I do? And what happened was everybody else in my cohort in graduate school had offices. Well, we all, I had an office, I guess. I never saw it because I had faint dreams of taking the baby to the office. No, because for one thing, a lot of the people in the other offices weren't so fond of babies at that point. But something happened to me because having taken care of this little person was so much more important than any of the assignments I was given that the assignments by comparison seemed small. But also I was like, like one person told me, a faculty advisor said, look, you put that kid to bed at 8 p.m. and then you work like a demon and everything has to fit after 8 p.m. So I worked from like 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. almost every night. And then I would take my assignments in and I would find that the other people in my cohort hadn't done the assignments. And the reason was they were too hard and too long. There, were, there was just too much work. There was a freaking ton of work. But I didn't know that. And it didn't, for me, it was like, I was trying to raise a human being, right? And so everything else seemed much less significant and therefore less frightening to me. So because I had this massive constraint of time and energy of having a child, it put me in a mental place where I just did the work. I never stopped to doubt myself. I didn't have time. I didn't have space. So, you know, constraint, response. And by the way, this is in all the creativity literature. They're like, if you can't come up with one idea for something in a, a night, tell yourself to come up with 10 ideas in an hour and suddenly you'll be able to do it because the constraint itself does something in the brain that kicks it into another gear. I think what happened to me was that my brain was actually working differently from my colleagues at Harvard because I was dealing with a baby brings in all these different skills. Anyway, then my next baby comes. This one has Down syndrome. Okay, That's a lot of constraints. But I'd been through all these other constraining situations and they'd always led to some kind of a quantum leap. And I had begun to think that the deeper the problem, the more liberating the solution would be. So every problem contains the raw material for its solution. And I couldn't find it after my son's diagnosis. And um, then I thought, okay, for me to make sense of this so that I feel happy, it, I am going to have to, what will I do? I tried all these different things. They said, you can do all these therapies with him. I'm like, that's not going to make him like a child who doesn't have a third, you know, a trisomy in his chromosomes. They said, well, you can um, take these courses in how to advocate for your child. And I'm like, okay, I, I know that's good, but I'm not happy yet. What I eventually did was that I reimagined the world. I reimagined my own reality as a place where Adam's life, my son's life, made as much sense as mine did or as anybody else's. And that meant that if something bad happens to me, my life is still worth as much as anyone's. And if something happens to you and whoever you are and wherever you are, as Mary Oliver said, whoever you are, wherever you are, no matter how lonely the world still offers itself to you. You still belong in the family of things. So as I reimagined the world, a lot of the 
shackles, the, the tentacles of, of academia and things started to fall away from my mind. And the world as I had imagined it, where everyone is perfect and beautiful and lovable, became obviously truer than my other version of reality. And I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. I'm just saying this massive constraint led me to a massive shift. And that shift has everything to do with why we're talking here today, why I've written books, why people have bought those books, because the way our culture imagines society is pretty dark for all of us, you guys. And to reimagine it as a place where we're all perfect and worthy to be able. And every time I looked at my son, I'd have to shift out of it <laughs> into no, I'm going to imagine reality this way and not the way I always thought of it before. And it was conscious for years and then it became unconscious. And as it became unconscious, every time I reach a constraint, things would open up more for me. So when I was 30, I ended up with, you know, I had these three kids under four. I had severe chronic pain. I had, um, I was still working on my PhD, finishing my dissertation. Um, I had like had this whole traumatic recovery of sexual abuse. I had lost most of my loved ones in the process of getting treatment for that. Like my life seemed so broken. And this was the point where I said, if I make it out of here, <laughs> people are going to pay me for solutions because I need to know what's constraining them, that, that what's constraining them is just a launch pad to something better than they've ever experienced. And I need to know it by experience. I have to, and I just sense that this had a lot to do with my mission in life, my purpose in life was to face constraints for myself and other people and then blast out of them with these leaps that the mind can make. And all the research on creativity says you put in a hard problem and the brain goes to work on it and you work and work and work. And then you drop it completely, usually in despair. And then you go out, I don't know, to get some Kool-Aid. And suddenly as you drink your glass of Kool-Aid, your mind pops in out of its previous norms and into a different way of perceiving the problem. So your world actually grows. And the more constraints we face, the more it grows. So I don't know what I'm going to do for two weeks with my foot above my heart in bed. Um, it's going to be interesting, but I know I'm going to devise methodologies for working with it. And I, I can probably, I'm going to guess right now, I may be wrong, that this time next year, I'll probably be teaching something online for people that I learned while lying for two weeks with my foot above my head, trying to connect with my people and like do an online business and write books and do all the rest. So I'm going into this thinking, Whoa, this is going to be, this is kind of constraining. This is going to be the source of a lot of wonderful ideas. I can hardly wait for the adventure. So now I'm going to take some questions. So Paulina says, Martha, you show your Duomo, but not to the camera. At least I couldn't see it. Oh, the Instagram people. I don't know if you can see it because of all the lights. I see you are in Italy, Paolina. I hope I did your Duomo not too much damage. It's such a gorgeous thing. Um, you know, the constraints that Michelangelo faced when he went to carve the David, he, they gave him a block of marble that was like, it had a fault line running through it that just made it almost unusable. It was good, good color and everything, but this fault line through the marble was like, and so he imagined a pose for the David that went right along the fault line of the rock. And that sculpture, when you walk into that room and see it, I literally almost fell down. I'd seen pictures and replicas of it my whole life. And when you actually see what he did with this flawed piece of marble, it it's electrifying. Like I wept. It just... And it's because he had a crap piece of marble that nobody else could use. And he's like, I'm going to figure it out. Christina says, problems help, chaos, peace, dark light, love, hate, suffering, awakening. Why did we sign up for so complicated an experience? We are in duality. 
you guys, or at least we appear to be in duality. Ooh, I just started another quantum mechanics book last night. It was so fun. Um, we don't actually live in duality. We live in a in a realm of infinite possibilities where infinite things are happening and infinite universes may be splitting off at every moment. We don't even know. The point is, um, in a dual system, there are things like I am looking at, at my computer. Um, in the way things really are, both the computer and I are composed of particles that are in fact, in, in their original sense, wave functions, which have no barriers between them and are completely fluid. If you watched last week, um, Jill Bol Bolte Taylor was on and she talked about how when her left hemisphere went out because of a stroke and she went to the right hemisphere, she experienced her body as being continuous with the universe and the same size as the universe. Her consciousness filled the universe. And that was a perception. It's to us in our left brain dominated society, duality objects and absence of objects, space and, and, uh, and items in space seem separate. In reality, they're not. So when Christina says, how did we choose? Why did we choose this experience? I believe, okay, you've got consciousness. Nobody knows what it is. So it's playing around. It can go out of duality and be in pure possibility and, and infinite probabilities. It can be a wave function. But for some reason, it's trying to get through into matter. And actually everything that I've painted lately has been some expression of the struggle to fit spirit into a material form. So it's about how, um, how the, like the struggle with like, how do you paint light when light is, you can't make light come from a canvas, but what do you do to make the appearance of light? In a non-dual system, everything is shining. In a dual system, there's light and dark. So we are doing this for the joy of the struggle. I think we went, okay, let's try this. Let's infuse our consciousness into matter. And then we were like, that's ridiculous. There's no such thing as matter. That's just a fairy tale. And then somebody said, no, if we look at it the right way, if we can constrain ourselves the right way, we will actually feel like isolated little objects bumping around through a physical universe where there's no meaning and everybody dies. And we all went, oh crap, that is gonna make us so unhappy. And then we were like, right? Think of the things we'll come up with once we're constrained in that way. Because the adventure, I've said this before too, the joy, the most joyful moments of our lives, the moments when we are blissed out, and I think maybe more blissed out than we ever could have been without this physical experience. It comes at the point of effort called deep practice or, or dedicated practice where we're trying to do something that we almost can't do. So for me, learning to go from pencil to pen and ink to watercolor was like tearing out my hair. It was like taking out my own pancreas with a dull spoon. It was not easy. And I was like, Rah! we see our baby now. She's just learning to crawl. And she does the, you know, the, the lady tennis yell. Now there used to be no yelling in tennis. And then there was, <laughs> we hear that yell coming from her crew. Ah! Ah! And you look at her and she's like clawing along the bars of her crib. And she's in the joy of discovery. She's in the joy of learning to move her body. But that soul fit in this tiny little package of human body. It's having a riot. It's having, she's a very happy baby. But um, so she grunts and she swears a great deal, but she also laughs a lot. Because at the moment when things are almost too hard and you're in that space where your brain is shifting over into the new idea, it is delicious. It is bliss. It is joy. It is the thrill. It's called the rage to master, the joy of mastering something in two dimensions. I think that's why we're here. And I think every time you start to do something that's hard for you, you're putting yourself with new constraints on your in a dualistic system, but you're always fighting that basic duality that runs through our entire experience. And that's why we're all talking about subjects like spirituality, because you have to find, you have to imagine a reality where everything you feel about yourself to be true will fit in. Yeah, so it's a joy and a delight and it's terribly difficult. Nimet, how are you doing? Nimet says, how can we effectively impose constraints on ourselves so we can kick our creativity into high gear? 
Well, you can just say something like, um, I said to myself, I want to paint the transformation of consciousness. That's what I want to paint. And I'm like, how do you do that? That's really hard. Um, but it it kind of floats my boat, right? So you think of something that you that floats your boat, and then you think of something that's too hard to do. And maybe for you, it's athletics. And you want to get to a certain, I don't know, handicap in golf, or you want to be able to run a mile in so many minutes or whatever it is. Maybe that's what floats your boat. Maybe... Um, for you, it's something about parenting and you want to create some amazing experience for children that will light them up. Whatever it is, whatever floats your boat, try to do something harder than you can do. And then tell people you're going to do it. And then put a date on it. I ran the Boston Marathon the first year I was at Harvard because I was in beginning Chinese class. And I somehow accidentally told the teacher, I was just trying to say that I jog sometimes. She got it in her head that I was going to run the Boston Marathon. And then she told everyone else in the class, and we were only allowed to speak Chinese, right? And my Chinese was never good. And so everybody in the class believed I was going to run the Boston Marathon. I thought, crap, I have like three months to train. And I started training, and I ran the Boston Marathon. So tell, tell peeps about what you're going to do. Ro just got her novel. Well, she got the first draft written because she told Liz Gilbert she was going to get it to her on a certain day. And then she told another friend of ours that she was going to get the rewrite to her on a certain day. And by God, she did it. With many um, Venus Williams style grunts, I have to say. <laughs> and I love you dearly, Ro. Um, but yeah, just, just we aim above the mark to hit the mark. So aim above the mark. Anne says, any tips on how reimagining life, how to reimagine life as a spiritual being? Go with whatever suffering is imposed upon you by this world, because the one thing the Buddha said that we're all sure to encounter is suffering. So the way to reimagine your life in a way that is spiritual is to find the place where you are suffering and find a way that it has meaning. This is what Viktor Frankl did in Auschwitz, a more horrible thing I can't imagine. And he found the, it, that the will to live for him and the people around him came from trying to make something meaningful. And he tried to make the experience of that horror itself meaningful. And he created this huge, um, a whole new way of looking at psychology because he managed to take even Auschwitz and put that into a system where he could find meaning. So yeah, take your suffering, make it a source of meaning, boom, it will make you creative and joyful. So Stephen says, how do we have the patience or blind faith to move through the constraints? The only thing that will, there's no patience involved for me. And there's certainly no blind faith, but there is the rage to master. I'll see something and I'll think I need to, or I'll even see it in my mind's eye. And I think I have to make that image. I have to, I have to. And it's a strong compulsion. And I do not know that I will succeed. Never will you know that you will succeed at doing exactly what you imagine, but you will succeed at something. It may be different from what you imagined, but there are many, many right answers to most problems. Almost you could say every problem and you will find some of them along the way. And once you've done it with one thing, like I did it with art, and then I did it with when I started having children, and it just kept, I kept doing more iterations of it. And the more you do it, the, no, the more you know the feeling of, okay, I'm so constrained, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, but I've been here before, and I know it comes right before the, the jump forward, so I'm gonna just hang. And then you can have faith in your own experience. But first you just do it because you have the rage to master, you just want to. So Yellow Moon Nicole says, I struggle with having too many ideas and so much creativity, and it's hard to focus on one thing. Any tips for how to go about this? Yeah, I would try to solve a problem of um, service. I would try to make something that is in the service of someone you love or a group of people you love who are maybe neglected or in some way um, underserved, impoverished or whatever, whether it's an individual or a group of people. Focus on making something to help, and it crystallizes what you're doing really, really nicely. There's nothing, and my ultimate joy, I think, is coaching, which is where I took everything I learned from all the different constraints I'd faced, and I tried to help somebody else and created a coaching system. Who knew? Um, almost done here.
Uh, Michelle says, do you ever lose the feeling of enthusiasm that this will be cool? Yes. How do you get back to enthusiasm if you fall back into something less fun? You you just get you stay there until you think this this has sucked long enough. I'm going to wrench my mind around, try to make something, try to make something, pick up something with your hands or your brain and make something or and give yourself a lot of comfort and relief. You don't have to always shoot for the stars. You get to rest in between. So rest. Two more. How can we get ourselves to, into a creative through constraints mindset when our actual constraints haven't changed or increased? You can increase them easily. Just try to do something that's too hard. Boom, you're there. And finally, uh, disenlightened edits. What would you advise when most of your life has been constrained and now you're working to switch to ease? Gratitude for the lessons, good place to start, but working to switch the belief of it being hard. It's only hard when you first face the constraint and when you're going through the, the quantum wave that gives you the solution. Right now, I've, I'm working on a painting that I've been struggling with forever. I talk about it every week on the gathering room. I've done many versions. And now I'm at the place where I've done it so many times and I know where I'm going and I'm just going, dee, 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 dee. now drawing with pen and ink is a fun exploration of something that's familiar. So is watercolor and to some extent, so is oil. Um, and certainly it's that way with coaching and with writing and with everything. There's always the rage to master. There's always the push against the constraint. There's always that invitation to the, the burst of enlightenment. But the familiarity also kicks in so that you start, it starts to be what's fun for you. And the brain takes it from the surface where it's struggling in the neocortex and literally pushes it down till it becomes part of what you do automatically. The way you can now tie your shoes or maybe drive a car or any other skill, write your name. These things were hard once and now they're easy. And the harder things get and the more you come up with constraints, the more incredible it is, incredible it is when they become easy. Are we going to have, we're going to have our little grunter here. Hi, would you like to say hello to the rectangle people? It's the rectangle people. Hello. This one is working. It has so many constraints on her and she's working so hard to get beyond them. But on the other hand, she is very good at destroying property. So she's already got through that one. Anyway, I'm not going to see you guys for three weeks from now, but I love you. I'll be thinking about you as I lie with my foot above my heart and send you all kinds of insights telepathically. Mwah, 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 mwah. I love you guys. See you in two, three weeks, three weeks from today, right here on the gathering room. Mwah. Bye for now.